welcome to another addictive episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast with your host and sailing addict, David Howes. Hi folks and welcome to this episode 13 of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. This week we are with Chuck O'Malley, founder and loft manager at Chesapeake Sailmakers. Uh, this session with Chuck was published about a month ago on the 59 North Sailing Podcast and uh, it was a, a really, really good episode. I got a lot out of it from a technical and sail making, sail planning, uh, wardrobe point of view and contacted my uh, good friend Andy Shell at the 59 North Sailing Podcast who I've followed for probably two and a half years now and, and asked Andy if he'd mind if I shared that episode uh, with my uh, listeners as well. Um, I realized that uh, some of you are also subscribers to 59 North and if you aren't, I re- highly recommend that you do. It's a great uh, sailing podcast, certainly the best one I've listened to. Um, and Andy generously offered to share the episode um, with the Ocean Sailing Podcast audience, sent me the file. And so I've published it as a bonus episode uh, this week uh, on top of the er- earlier episode with Rob White from Evolution Sail Makers. So it's a bit of a technical week this week, folks, on uh, sail making, sail wardrobe planning from a cruising and racing point of view. And you'll find this episode is really complimentary, uh, quite different again to the conversation with Rob, uh, but really comp- complimentary in terms of rounding out your knowledge of um, sail wardrobes and modern materials and all, all of all the things you can do and all, all of the choices you have. So uh, as I uh, as I uh, go to publish this, it's the 1st of July, so first day of uh, summer for our Northern Hemisphere listeners, first day of winter uh, here in Australia, uh, first uh first day of uh, our new financial year uh, and, and it, this week for the first time uh, the Ocean Sailing Podcast when you search for uh, sailing podcasts and iTunes was ranked number one so that's that's a pretty cool milestone uh, for me after three months it wasn't something I really set out to do or thought was possible but I guess uh, I, I take it as a, as a, as a reinforcement that uh, if we keep producing interesting content, uh, then you'll find it valuable and, and um, enjoy listening to it. So um, certainly that's my goal to keep doing that. So uh, thank you all for uh, listening and for tuning in and for scri- subscribing. If you haven't subscribed, you can subscribe uh, through iTunes or you can subscribe through Stitcher, uh, whether you've got an Android or a, an Apple device. Uh, if you go to oceansailingpodcast.com, go to the subscribe page. There's uh, links there to Apple and Android apps. Uh, if you want to access those apps, to then subscribe to the show. Um, so, so take advantage of that. If you if you wonder how do I get hold of the show on a regular basis, obviously once you subscribe via uh, those applications, then you just get an automatic notification each week whenever a new episode is released. So, uh, check that out at oceansailingpodcast.com and. Uh, Again, if you haven't checked out 59 North, uh, 59-north.com or just search for 59 North uh, in any of the uh, podcast apps, uh, it's a it's a great uh, same podcast show. I think this is episode 150 that Andy shared with me. Uh, I recommend that you check it out, subscribe. Uh, again, great content from all over the Northern Hemisphere uh, and, and I think you'll find that really, really interesting as well if you uh, if you enjoy the Ocean Sailing Podcast as Andy has been a been a bit of an inspiration for me giving me a lot of advice technically on how to set up the platform for the podcast and lots of encouragement and support so he certainly helped me to get out of the blocks uh, in as smooth a way as possible um, and uh, certainly knows what he's doing so enjoy this episode with Chuck O'Malley from Chesapeake Sailmakers. Um, Chuck O'Malley is with Chesapeake Sailmakers here in Annapolis. I've known Chuck for the last 10 years. Uh, he's worked on my sails, my dad's boat, uh, and some other stuff I've done. Just recently, Chuck built a brand new mainsail for our Swan 48 Eastbjorn, and um, it was amazing. It got we, we blew up our old mainsail. It got done in two weeks. We picked it up in St. Martin, and it is just fantastic. And he's going to talk a little bit about specifically, um, you know, the sail we got made and why we got it made with certain features specific to blue water sailing. And I'll let him explain that. But um, we do a bunch of events over at Chesapeake Sailmakers as well. If you do in Delmarva, the Delmarva seminar is going to be over at the loft, as will um, some of the parties and stuff we have around that. So do a lot of stuff over at the loft year-round. 
And uh, Chuck is a, a great guy to work with and really knows his stuff. So I'll leave it to him to talk about offshore sales and sail making. Thank you, Chuck. Great. Thanks, Andy. Um, welcome, everybody. I appreciate you having me here. We're, um, we're going to cover a lot of ground in a very short period today. Um, so it's going to be an overview. I'll be here after the break. I'll stay for lunch. I've got samples to show people for different cloths. But we're going to try and really address offshore sales and what you need to think about, what you need to start preparing for, and how using sales offshore is very different from maybe how you've been using them currently. Um, so with that, um, offshore sailing. What does it mean to me as a sailmaker? It's, it's a, as I mentioned, it's a very different approach. And basically, um, when you're on the bay, you're using your sails, but you, you get to pick and choose when you go out. You get to pick and choose the conditions you sail in. It's uh, very different. When you go offshore, your sails, I'm bringing all these in here, your choices are, things are dictated to you more. Um, you're making a long passage. All of a sudden, your sails shift from being used in good conditions or fair conditions to now you're going to have periods of extended times in UV, extended wear and tear. You don't get to choose what sea state or what wave, um, what wind conditions you're sailing. So the sails get a lot more, um, a lot more demands on them. We're going to a lot of wear and tear, a lot of weathering, a lot more chafe. Uh, even just the acts of putting a reef in actually has a lot of uh, wear and tear, takes a lot of life out of sails. So all of these things factor into, as a sailmaker, things I consider when I build an offshore sail versus when I build a sail for someone who's bay cruising or even sometimes coastal cruising. So it really makes a difference in how we approach the sail we're going to build. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to like try and think about what does it take, what goes into making a good sail? What do we have to think about? And the foundation of any good sail is going to start with sail fiber, the, the cloth. And so within the cloth, and we'll have lots of different types of cloth, but the basic fibers we use, and the fiber is what's going to dictate how strong the, the cloth is. We're going to have Dacron or polyester. This has been tried and true. We've used it forever. Uh, there have been lots of advances in it. It's been a more engineered product in the last 10, 15 years than it has been. But it's um, lots of different weights, lots of different styles, lots of different weaves. It used to be um, when Ted Hood pioneered this back in the you know, late 50s, it was a cross-cut XY axis type of weaving, and the same fiber was on the X axis as was on the Y axis. Today, we really mix the weave construction mix. So you might have a 70-30 weave or a 60-40 weave or you know, still 50-50 depending upon the sale. But we change the way that the cloth is used with the Dacron polyester fiber. Pentex is a fiber that kind of came on. It was real strong. We thought it was going to be a silver bullet for cruising sails. As it turned out, it was a fiber that had great strength in the laboratory, but once it started getting a uh, flex and flogging, exposure UV, it wasn't as strong as what we initially thought. It's basically uh, polyester or Dacron on steroids. So it ended up not being that silver bullet we were looking for. Aramid fibers are fibers we see more commonly in race boat applications. Uh, but one of the fibers that's really nice as you get into bigger boats for cruising is Vectran. It's got great flex qualities, very low stretch, uh, very poor UV. So what we do with a Vectran fiber is we coat it with titanium oxide, which adds a little bit of weight to it, but it makes it more, not impervious, but makes it a much better fiber for UV. But this is something more for bigger boats. Carbon, again, that's been a big buzz in the racing community. It's filtering down into the cruising community. Uh, the nice thing is it's impervious to UV. It's got very high strength uh, to weight. It's not super heavy. One of the drawbacks for a lot of cruisers is it's black, so they don't really like having uh, black or grayish looking sails. Um, but the other big thing is it's got poor flex qualities. Carbon's basically a, a fairly brittle material. So when you put it into a sail, on a main sail it might not be too bad other than flogging considerations. But on a Genoa, if you have a big overlapping Genoa, every time you tack, you're going to be taking some life out of the carbon sail. So you have to think about how we do that. And as a result, as sail makers, what we've started doing is we started with a carbon that was a, a very strong, low stretch carbon. And now we've dialed back the initial modulus to create a carbon that's actually got a, the, a, might stretch a little bit more than what the perfect race environment is. But the more we dial back the initial modulus to stretching, the more we get to a better flex quality. So it's trying to find that happy median between the two uh, properties. And then the last one we see is spectra 
where a lot of times we hear it called Dyneema. Dyneema is a great product for flex. It's a lightweight fiber. It's got great ultimate strength. Um, it's got a little bit of creep to it, but for a cruising application, I don't really find that to be an issue. And the, on the only other problem we see with Spectra is it's got a little bit of an oil fin oily finish to it. The fiber itself is a very slippery fiber. As a result, a lot of times in laminating, it's not a great fiber for lamination. Uh, so it's very hard when we do these cruise laminates or oriented fibers to get a good sandwich with that fiber. It tends not to uh, stick as well as some of the other fibers out there. So we've got the predominant fibers that we're going to deal with. And now the, the next thing we'll look at is what types of sailcloth. So if you think about, um, we've got Dacron, Aramids, uh, Pentex, Spectra, all these fibers go into making up a sailcloth. So we start with the, the most basic, uh, and that's woven. Woven is every white Dacron sail you see is basically a woven product. And that means it's, uh, it's just, just like we make clothing. It's just a, on a loom, they weave material, it comes out on a roll, and we build sails out of it. The neat thing for sail making, and when Andy just talked about his boat, um, the woven materials for years were just a standard Dacron. Now we're seeing a big push in the engineering of woven materials to create hybrid wovens. So Dacrons with Spectrus blended into them, or we're creating uh, wovens where we have a very engineered approach to the way the XY axis of the weave is. So we can create a really strong um, triradial type or what we call a warp oriented fiber. So wovens have, there's been a lot of research and development in the woven cloths because we're finding the durability of wovens, the lack of mold and mildew concerns, all of these things are, as we, as we travel through technology, we're coming back quite often to what was original and now we're just trying to improve the original technology. Um, laminated sails are um, great for high performance. We're still using the same, whether it's polyester, whether it's Spectra, whether it's Pentex, whether it's Vectran, the structural fiber is still the same in a cruise laminate sail as it is in a woven sail, but the application, the way we build it's different. Um, the pictures probably don't show up real well, but in a laminated sail, you might have what feels like one layer of cloth, but it's actually five different pieces all glued together and put under pressure to create a, a one unit. So you'll have in the center a structural grid of the fiber, then two layers of mylar, and then two layers of a very lightweight Dacron. Those all get sandwiched together to create a one layer of material. And what happens is we call it a cruise laminate because all those layers of adhesive go together. This material's got great shape holding. It creates a little bit lighter sail, but over the life, it's, more, it's gonna be more prone to some delamination because all those layers over, life, over the span of use tend to break down. The glue starts to fail over time and now you get some air pockets and those air pockets leave the moisture penetration, mold and mildew concerns over the long span, not immediately. And these products have gotten much better. They're putting fungicides in the, the adhesives and they're treating the sales topically to help prevent moisture penetration. So it's really come a long way. We're seeing more of this in bigger boats. We see some of this also in Genoa's. Uh, just Okay, so, so bigger boat, um, it's, a, it's a great question. Like for instance, on a, on a 40 foot boat, I might think about a cruise laminate for my Genoa because I don't have, and we'll, we're jumping ahead a little bit, but we don't have any, um, anything supporting our Genoa. The Genoa's out there, we're tacking, there are no battens, you don't really get a lot of benefit from the mast, you don't get benefit from the boom, you don't have reef patching in a Genoa, so you're asking the cloth to do a lot. So on a 40 foot boat, a cruise laminate or an oriented fiber might be an option depending upon how performance oriented you are. But if a mainsail on a 40 foot boat because you have battens and you have reef patching, it's connected to the boom, it's connected to the mast, a Dacron, a standard Dacron main might be fine. So and, and we're, what we're going to get to is boat size, you know, when you start to move into 55 feet, suddenly you're moving into Woven products, uh, if you go with a traditional Dacron, you might need to be up into an 11 ounce cloth. And the problem with those Dacrons in the heavier weights is there's not as much um, R&D being done in construction of heavier weight pure Dacrons. Because we find that the sails get stretched. Dacron's elastic by nature, so it doesn't hold shape as well as we like it to. So most of the 
R&D, most of the innovation in the woven materials is moving towards what we just did on Andy's boat, and that is, it's a Dacron Spectra blend. So it's a woven material, but it's a, you know, on a boat Andy size, a 48 footer, the mainsail might be uh, 50, 60% Spectra by weight, 40% Dacron by weight, but it's blended where it looks like it's all one material. But it's that blend of materials which giving you kind of the best of both worlds. You have a woven sail, very great shape holding, longevity is incredible, and you've got a no mold and mildew concerns, no delamination concerns. So it's, it, as you move up to a bigger boat and the loads increase, that's what starts to dictate what you have to do. And you either have to move to the hybrid type of wovens or you move into one of the laminated products. And that's, I feel like at 40 feet for Genoa, 45 feet, as you get to 50, 60 feet and multi hulls over 40 feet, you start to move into a higher tech material or a higher tech construction approach. Oriented fiber um, is something that we're seeing on all these race boats. If you've looked at all the race boats where the, they have strings in the all, all different directions, that's an oriented fiber sail. We're seeing this trickle into the cruising market and it's become very popular with performance cruising boats, creates a lighter sail, um, very customized, very engineered. It's a very strong sail. The, it has all the drawbacks of cruise laminate. You're still laminating layers of fiber together and over time it'll break down probably breaks down a little bit earlier than a production built cruise laminate because this is being done in a factory with very controlled pressures, very controlled uh, heating going into the um, drums that produce it. This is built more on a boat by boat basis. So there's not quite the control. Still a very high quality product, very engineered, but it's just not quite as manufactured as some of the other products out there. So. Now we've got our fibers we've thought about. We've thought about the, the type of cloth, whether it's a woven or cruise laminate or oriented fiber. And now we'll kind of look at some of the different things here. Cross-cut sails are basically, we see a lot where the panels run horizontally. This is tried and true construction, very, um, very uh, easy to understand, very easy to maintain, very easy to recut, very easy to get fixed pretty much anywhere you're gonna go in the world. It's, it's understood pretty much by all sail makers. And, and this is gonna be limited more to, there's one version of cruise laminate you can build with a cross cut, but predominantly um, Dacron sails. So almost all white sails will be done in a cross cut fashion. Um, very little waste. If you look at the way it's laid out, you have very little waste in a sail like this. But the, the drawback is if this sail is nine ounces, it's nine ounces from the front to the back. So there's very little opportunity to engineer your approach with this sail. You have to say if the highest loads are out here and I need 10 ounce cloth out here, I'm gonna build the whole sail as a 10 ounce sail. When in the front of the sail, we know the loads are about half of what they are here. So in the front, you might not need 10 ounces, but you have to build it to the, the worst case loading. So the next type of sail we look at is a tri-radial construction. So triradial construction is what we find in most cruise laminate sails. They, cruise laminates are built or when we build the fabric where it's what we call warp oriented. The loads are oriented in the long axis of the cloth when we make a roll of cloth. And so you'll end up with these sails with all these triangular panels. Um, creates a very high performance sail, but it, it's, uh, as you can imagine, there's a lot more cloth waste. Each one of these panels has to be what we call nested. They, we have to line the load of the fiber and the cloth with the predicted load in the sail. So that process of aligning those loads means that all these little triangles, the off cut of the triangle can't be used. It's not like we can take, take it, turn it the other way and put it someplace else on sale. The nesting efficiency probably end up with close to 20% to 23% waste on a tri-radial sail. In addition to the waste, there's a lot more labor involved with the construction of the sail. The benefit to the triradial it all comes down to performance and strength. If we know, just like we talked about the other sail, the leech of the sail has twice as much load as the front of the sail, I can come out here, put a 10 ounce material out here, and in the low load areas along the luff, I can drop down and build a, a six ounce material. So I can really engineer the sail, and that extends the life, makes the sail perform better over its life. So that's a lot of things we're doing. The other neat thing about this type of construction now is a lot of the hybrid materials, just like Andy's sale we talked about, is Andy's sale is built out of a, a product made by Dimension Polyant. Uh, Dimension Polyant's got a 
factory in Connecticut. They've got a main factory in Germany. But that material is called a hydronet radial. It's a spectrodyne, uh, spectrodacron blend. And that sail is built as a triradial. So it's a dacron woven product, but it's designed, the cloth is designed and engineered to be built as a triradial sail. So it gives me all the performance of a racing sail, but without any of the drawbacks of delamination, mold and mildew. And I can engineer that dacron spectra sail by going lighter in the front, heavier in the back. So it's a really neat uh, process. And then the last type we look at is what we call oriented fiber. So in this sale, um, they actually have a big gantry. You know, it's probably a sale like this would be laid out and the, the machine is about as big as this room. Gantry runs all the way across and in that gantry there are 18 uh, filament layers. And so at this end of the room there'd be all these bundles of carbon or Vectran or polyester or spectra. They come up, they go down into this gantry arm, and the gantry arm has, is computer driven, and it has the load diagram of the sail. We do a, a load analysis, come up with the layout of where we want these yarns to pass, and then that machine will just go ahead and lay yarn exactly along a load path that we've designed. Really high tech, it's really cool. Um, a sail for, say, a 40-footer is probably going to be strung and laid out in about six hours. Uh, and, it's, and, the, and the fiber is placed in a very precise method. Uh, so it's a really neat process. And you can see, for instance, some of the benefits to this type of layout. Every time you have a reef, you can see there are different passes. So we can design you know, arcs to go into reinforced reefing so we don't have, we have a really strong reef point without adding extra weight to the sail. So the whole point of these sails is as you get to bigger and bigger boats, um, these sails give us the strength we need without adding a lot of weight or a lot of bulk, and it, it lets us specifically engineer. It's amazing now, a lot of these mega yachts you see, most of these mega yacht sails are being built out of materials like this. And instead of laminating together, you know how I said you have the fiber in the center and then two pieces of mylar and then two pieces of dacron? These mega yacht sails quite often will have a fiber, two layers of mylar, another layer of fiber, another layer of mylar. Now they can get up to seven or eight layers to create the strength they need. So it's a lot of lamination to build these mega yacht sails. But what they're finding is uh, these types of sails are really the only sails that can give you the strength you need to hold shape. And you know, now we're seeing the Nantucket bucket and the St. Bart's bucket. They're starting to race these mega yachts. And so people are concerned with performance. So the drawback to these sails are they don't last quite as long. Uh, they're, they're completely driven by performance, weight savings and strength and shape holding at the expense of uh, performance or at the expense of lifespan. So you think about the construction, the fiber, the types of cloth. If you look at Dacron, a good Dacron sale could probably give you something in the neighborhood of 15,000 to 20,000, 25,000 miles, really well constructed. If you move to a Dacron or to a triradial sail out of a hybrid type material, a woven material, you can really, like any sail, I would expect that sail to go 30 to 40,000 miles without a lot of concerns. It's something, now in Andy's case, that might only be four years. So it doesn't sound like a lot of time, but 10,000 miles a year is a pretty aggressive cruising schedule. The cruise laminates, depending upon what fiber you go with, you can look at a triradial cruise laminate sail and be in that same general 30,000 to 40,000 mile range. The, the, the big difference is when you get into like the 25,000 mile on, you're going to see the beginning signs of lamination breakdown. So there's going to be some more air pockets and now moisture will get in and you'll start to see mold and mildew showing up in the sail. So there are the little things in cruise laminate. Structurally, the sail's still going to be fine. Aesthetically, it's going to look bad. And then as you start to push it out towards the end of its life, um, you'll see it start to break down more rapidly with the lamination. Once the delamination starts, it starts to accelerate its own process. And then with the oriented fiber sails and membrane sails, as we call them, that's probably something that's going to be more like a 20,000 mile sail when it's really well built and engineered. And so you've got a half-life from a really nice hybrid uh, woven triradial sail. So I, I like to look at the fiber, the type of cloth, and the construction first because it sets the foundation. Every sail decision we make, we're going to come back to what cloth, what construction method. So some of the things I like 
to get people thinking about this point now is what drives your decision? Everybody's motivated by something different. Um, performance, if you were an X racer and you bought a Swan or you bought a Hylus or you bought a, a cruising boat that's a per very performance oriented cruiser, you might be more driven to go to an oriented fiber membrane type sail or a cruise laminate sail or a tri-radial hybrid type sail than the guy who has an island pack of 45. Now, when I unpack a 45, you were looking for a strong, durable, you no know, good sea boat underneath you. So there are different things that drive us. Those things have to go into what drives your decision on sales. Reliability, any offshore sailor, I think reliability has got to be up there. And that's going to come out through your cloth choice and also through some of your construction details. Longevity, that's a big driver. If you're someone who says, hey, I want to go really fast, and if I have to replace my sails every third year, I'll replace my sails every third year, every fourth year. And depending upon the type of cruising you do, if you do the World Arc, you might find at the end of the World Arc, those sails are done, you know, depending upon what they've been through and uh, where they've gone. Affordability, budget always enters into the equation. So we always have to think about you know, what's more expensive. Cross-cut Dacron, because of the ease of construction, because the more efficiency in the cloth layout, it's going to be a more budget conscious sale. And that might be a really good choice for a main, but maybe you spend a little bit more money on the Genoa. So there are different things to weigh and consider. And then appropriate technology. You know, that's, I, I have a number of clients, they come in and they really like the membrane sales. They love the membrane sales. But they have a, a Valiant 42, or they have a, a you know, a Pacific Seacraft 37. I said, you know, I'm glad you like the membrane sales, but to be honest, they're only going to give your boat a marginal increase in performance. So for the extra money you're going to spend to get the performance that you can get out of a membrane sale, there are limitations to your boat and you didn't buy your boat because you wanted to be the fastest guy upwind. You know, that's n different things drove you to your decision of what boat you chose. So it's part of being a sail maker and part of counseling our clients is to understand what technology is the right technology for the boat and trying to help them decide on the appropriate technology. So. All of these things weigh into what drives your decision on how to choose uh, the proper sale. So now we'll move into working sales. I like to start with the main sale because it's really, in most regards, it's the most complex sale on the boat. There are, your most decisions will be made around your main sale. So on a main sale, we have to consider material selection and construction method. So that comes back to what types of cloth, what type of fiber, tri-radial, cross-cut, and this is going to be true for mainsails, genoas, even spinnakers, is that those two are always the foundation of deciding on how to, how to start our sail. Then we move into batten structure, we move into reef layouts, we move into luff track systems, sail handling systems, um, in boom furling, in mass furling. So there are lots of different considerations with the mainsail that we're going to start to think about. And the first one I like to start with is batten structure. There's always a, a question of, do I do full battens? Do I do a mix of some full, some partial? Do I do uh, all partial? Do I do no battens? Um, I addressed a lot of the Seven Seas cruisers. A lot of the Seven Seas people like no battens, but you have to understand what the give and take is. If you have a full batten main, it's going to help increase your performance. I can help design a better sail with a full or a full partial batten combination. It's going to dampen the flogging better than a sail that doesn't have battens or a sail that has partial battens. It's going to extend the life of the sail. You know, I, I equate battens to like bones in your arm. If you didn't have any bones in your arm, this would just flap around into a big piece of skin. But when you put battens in, you can really create structure to your sail and help add life to it. Uh, hand in hand with that, I do a lot of engineered battens. We used to do engineered battens on racing sails all the time. Cruising sails would come in and we just do one flat piece of fiberglass batten stock that we'd stick in the sail and it bend uniformly. Now battens have gotten really um, engineered and a, a really nice approach where we can take a batten and say, okay, we want the bending moment of the batten to be at 40 percent and we want the back end of the batten to be stiffer so it holds that wing, the designed wing that we have in the sail. That's all done through batten technology now and we can, uh, you know, battens have gotten lighter, they've gotten more engineered. so. I do that on all my cruising sails. It's just a, a standard course. It's just, why wouldn't I want to help my cruising sail 
last longer, look better, and have a better shape, just like my racing sale. And the batten cost is nominal. It's, it's, it's not adding, it's not doubling the price of the sale. So it really, it just makes a lot of sense. Easier handling with full batten sales, and you have to have some specialty fittings. A lot of boats with full batten sales have to go to some kind of track system to make the sail go up and down easier. You know, the longer the batten is, the more compression it has on the mast, and the harder it makes it to go up and down. Partial battens, a little bit lower performance, you're gonna have less roach to the sail. Um, it might be easier for reefing because you don't have a batten in the sail, so you don't have to worry about twisting or bending battens or breaking battens. Generally, there's less chafe, and that's one of the big reasons people go away from full battens or a mix of full and partial to all partial or no battens. The hardware is simpler, um, but even when I do a partial batten sale, I still go with the engineer battens now. Um, it's amazing how many older sales we get in that have partial battens, and the battens are, you know, it's like a, a board in the sail. And so you see the whole nice sail shape, and then you get to the batten, and it's like staying straight, and the sail doesn't take that nice curvature. So you can do an engineered partial batten sail, have a tapered, flexible tip in the front and a stiffer part in the back, and create a nice sail shape. And most of the partial batten sails we do now, way back when, you know, 20 years ago, the battens would pretty much all be, you know, 30 inches or 33 inches. Now when we do a partial batten sail, the battens are different sizes and they're more related, their length is related more to the girth of the sail at each point where they are. So you might have a partial batten, but it might be 60 inches long, you know, through the body of the sail to help support some roach. It just helps, this, it helps the life of the sail, helps our designed wing much better. So this just shows you a little graphic of um, one full batten, three partials, or all full battens. Just gives you something to think about. Reefing is incredibly important for offshore sails. Um, if you're on the bay sailing, or if you're up on the coast or coastal cruising, quite often you can pick and choose when you go out. You say, hey, you know, if it's blowing 30 knots, I'm just, we're gonna wait, this will pass. You just had the weather thing. He talks heavy weather is short in duration, so you can pick and choose when you go. When you do an offshore passage, you don't have that luxury. You know at some point this sail is going to be reefed, and so you have to really think about your reefing options. Uh, and there's always a two reef versus three reefs. And so one of the things I like to look at is in a two reef main, a standard reef lamp might be 12% and 25%. If I do an offshore main, I would do 15 and 30, with the idea being a two reef person has got a storm tri sail. And so their, their weather plan, their heavy weather plan is one reef, two reef, storm tri sail. Um, single line reefing is really nice. You have to look at how it works. A lot of these booms have shuttles in the, in the booms now, and that dictates where you can put your reef points. So you might not be able to get uh, a 30% reef. You might have to be 12 and 25 based on the way it's set up inside the boom. A lot of the Selden booms have that shuttle. Some of the old isomets had that shuttle. So that dictates your reefing, how deep we can put a reef in. Um, we just did an Andy sale, and I'm doing it almost all my offshore sales. In the back end, we used to always have the grommet in the sail, and your reef line would go through. So now I've started moving away from the grommet. I think I have a picture, and having um, a low friction ring on the back of the sail. And that low friction ring um, looks a little bit like a grommet, but it's external to the sail, so there's left, less wear and tear and less chafe on the sail. The way it's set up, it can self-align, so it isn't twisting in the back, and it really reduces the friction a lot. And the sail strength is, is uh, you know, in the highest load point of the sail, we punch a hole in it. Now we don't have to do that, so we really maintain sail strength a lot. A um, couple other little things. Mark your halyard so it's easier to reef, especially at night. Reef early, reef ahead of the need, and storm tri-sail. With three reefs, I look at standard reef might be 12, 25, and 36. If I go offshore, 12, 30, 45. Uh, anybody here with multi-hulls? So multi-hulls, this is a really good example. And a multi-hull, most of our multi-hulls now, a lot of them have square tops. A lot of them definitely have big roach mains. When you look at a multi-hull main versus, say, a main like Andy's boat. Andy's boat has a pretty good sized boom, but relative to the hoist of his, ma his main, it's a high aspect ratio sail. A lot of multi-hull sails, you know, you could have a 21-foot boom on a 42-foot multi-hull with a 45-foot hoist. So you've got a lot of area, especially that big road. So if you were to reduce your, your reefing in this pattern, when you put your third reef in, you still have a lot of sail area up. 
So you have to think about this, and I should back up. When I say 12, 30, or 45, what I'm referring to is the luff. So if you have a 50-foot luff, 12% of that luff. So if I make it easy and go with 10, you're going to take 5 foot out in the first reef. If the second reef were 20, you're taking 10%. If I go to 30, I'm, I'm taking out the next step. So that's what these refer to. And in a standard triangle, if I use these numbers, I'm reducing area pretty proportionately. But if you have a multi-hull with this square top or with a big roach, and I use these numbers, I'm not taking the area out as quickly as I need to. So that's why I start thinking about reductions of luff in this way. So I can take more sail area out at each reef. So something to think about. Now, so mizzens are more personal. For instance, a lot of boats will sail jib and jigger. So on a mizzen, I might go with one deeper reef, or depending upon my discussion with the client, I might do two reefs, with the second reef being there more for dropping it in, and that now becomes his anchor riding sail. So a lot of my clients with mizzens will use that second, drop the mizzen down to the second reef, and that's his riding sail more than it is his you know, storm conditions. But a lot of boats with mizzens, you'll go one deep reef and then sail jib and jigger, and that's, that's how you'll set up with a, a boat like that. Um, some other little things, color-coded reef lines, really nice. Reef I had a need. Understand reef ties. A lot of the boats you'll have in your mainsail, you have those reef diamonds that tie in the sail to the boom. And that's not to, that's just to gather the sail. That's not, those aren't designed to bear load ever. And so they're always set below the, if you look at the plane of the sail, you have your, your reef cringle front and back. Those diamonds should always be below. So they're not gathering the load. So it's, it's something, they're just there just to, to hold the sail to the boom so it doesn't go falling overboard, collect with water. This just shows some of the more common reefing systems, whether you have single line, whether you have a slab reef set up. Uh, this shows that low friction ring. You can see it's webbed into the sail and it hangs off the back of the sail. Um, so a lot of little neat things have been done in reefing. But for offshore sailing, it's an important consideration to make sure you've got a reefing system that works. Um, mainsail handling systems, this is another really important issue. Um, whether you use roller slides, whether you use a strong track, a Harkin or Antol style track, all of those things, especially if you go to full battens, it's going to make raising and lowering the sail uh, much more palatable. It's going to make reefing the sail much easier. So you need to think about that. As you go into a bigger boat, you know, 40 feet and up, full battens, almost mandatory to have some type of track system. Um, boats, you know, under 50 feet, the strong track system works really well. They'll do a one-piece track up to 60 foot in length. And it's, it's uh, very reliable. We've been using them since 97, 98, and we've had no, no failures with it. The Harkin and Antrol tracks, as you get into bigger boats, become a, a necessity, and they're incredibly strong, well-engineered. What I like about the strong track for, other, for boats under 50 feet is there are no moving parts. So very little maintenance, very little to go wrong. It's just a, a neat system. Other thing to look at is you've got in-mass furling and lots of different sail choices there. In boom furling, there are lots of different systems there. On the mainsail flaking and gathering, you know, you've got as simple as lazy jacks, Dutchman type of systems. You can move into any one of the type of cradle cover systems. And then also what we're seeing a trend towards now, used to be only in mega yachts, but we're seeing a trend towards these pocket booms, even in smaller boats. Um, I think Tartan was one of the first manufacturers to introduce pocket booms. And now we're starting to see a lot of other manufacturers and spar builders offering pocket booms in boats in the 40 and 45 foot range. Yeah, so a pocket boom, instead of the boom being just like a, a round tube or a rectangular tube, the pocket boom is more uh, V-shaped and the sides come up and then it rolls and then it has like a little trough on the inside. So when you drop your main, it's getting cradled in a, whether it's carbon fiber, some of them are doing it out of aluminum, but it creates a trough that the main lives in, it, it drops down into. You still have a cover that goes over it, but it, basically it helps cover, you know, it, the main drops into a trough that holds maybe 25 to 40% of the main, depending upon what it is. And it just, it, it's all a, a handling system technique. Um, so this shows for in-mass furling, traditional main, no battens. If you think of the, the rectangle, that sail is half of the rectangle, so you've got a sail area of 50%. 
When you move to partial vertical battens, you can get up to about 53% of the rectangle. When you move to vertical full battens, you can get up to about 54, 55% of the triangle or the rectangle. A traditional cruising main full battens is going to be about 57% of that rectangle. So the whole key here is we move from losing a lot of area to adding back some, to adding back some more. Um, when we get here and here, the other thing we can do is we can start to add some shape to the sail. When we have a, a in mass furling main without any battens, it's very hard to add shape because we don't have anything to help support it. And as we're trying to furl around that mandrel, the more shape we have, the more it's going to bunch up. So adding some battens adds a little bit of complexity to the furling operation, but it does let us uh, create a better sail design for you to, to kind of get back to an aerodynamic wing. So in boom furling, uh, and this shows a leisure furl system, but there's pro furl, there's boom furl, there's Schaefer. There are a lot of different options. And these options used to start off where they were only available to monohulls. We're seeing more and more multi-hulls move into these in boom systems as well. Uh, but this basically lets me design a traditional full batten performance oriented mainsail, and it's gonna furl around a mandrel inside this boom. Um, I tell my clients with, with these systems, they're very reliable, very nice systems. It's an acquired taste. You're not going to go out day one with it and fall in love with it. But within probably two months, two months of use, you're going to find it makes life much easier for you, especially as you get to bigger boats. Reefing is very convenient. Everything is generally done from the cockpit. Um, more or less necessary to have an electric winch to try and do something like this. Um, the specific drawback is cost. Um, for instance, if you have a boat now and you want to move to this system, an average 40-foot boat, 45-foot boat, it's probably going to cost you somewhere around thirty to thirty-five thousand to go from what you have to this system, because uh, we have to design a mainsail specific. The mainsail design each batten has to have a certain angle, and then the construction of the sail is different from a regular construction. But that's probably the biggest difference in uh, why you don't see a lot of them aftermarket. And OEM manufacturers don't like to do it because it it takes training, and so as a result, some of them do it. But if they don't provide the necessary training, clients tend to have problems with them you know, because there's an education piece involved. So as an OEM manufacturer, they tend not to want to, they want to sell you the boat, get you going, but don't want to be there to train you how to use it. So um, that, that's what I see. But they're very reliable. It's a, it's a product that makes a lot of sense for lots of us cruising husband and wife type of cruisers. It really is a reliable product. Um, Dutchman or cradle cover, these are lower cost options to how to handle your mainsail. You started seeing these mostly on catamarans, a lot of the charter boats, but it's a, it's a nice product. It's very reliable. When I started with Doyle, I left Quantum and I didn't think I was going to sell many of these and I was amazed when I started building them and using them, how well they worked. Uh, again, there's, it's not a silver bullet, but it does a really nice job of making it easy to handle mainsails on bigger boats. And this shows a tartan pocket boom, so you can kind of see how the the boom has a V shape, the sail drops in. This is a 43 footer, and we built like a little modified stack pack for this. Um, so it gives you an idea of what a pocket boom looks like. So at this point, we've decided battens, we decided the reef structure, we've looked at the cloth type, we looked at the construction method we're going to do. And we want to look at what details, what construction features should we be looking for in a good blue water sail. Luff reinforcements, batten reinforcements, belts and bridges. So there are the things that go up between the reefs, these bridges that help stop hinging and break down. Um, chafe protection, you know, and a lot of times your old sail will be the best indication of where the sail chafes and where it breaks down. Your reef handling systems. We want to think about areas where it's going to be machine sewn and areas where it's going to be hand sewn. Um, wide seam allowances multi-step zigzag instead of a standard zigzag we want multiple steps it almost looks like a, a straight stitch but just in a zigzag method and overhead leech line so you can adjust your leech line without having to go uh, to the back end of the boom and hang off the back of the boat and so this just shows some details here's like an overhead leech line coming over top of a batten pocket here's the reinforcement for a luff slide you know so you have a lot of meat there so you're not going to be pulling slides out uh, it's hard to see it here but this piece here over a reef has a different type of material that's sacrificial. It's a really great material for chafe, so you're not chafing the sail. Um, batten pockets are machine sewn and also hand sewn. 
um, headboards that are you know, pressed on hydraulically with stainless steel rings and also webbed on. So just lots of little details that go into making a good, good offshore sail. So now we'll move to head sails. So head sails, for a lot of our boats, is a driving engine, but it's a much simpler process. The decisions we have to make are they're much, a lot fewer decisions. Um, basically, the one of the biggest decision, again, material selection and construction method. You know, are we doing a cross-cut Dacron sail or are we doing a tri-radial hybrid woven material? Um, once that decision's out of the way, and that's really a critical decision to think about what, what materials we're going to use and how we're going to build it, what method of construction. Then we think about sizing. And head sail sizing, LP is what sail makers talk about all the time, and we take for granted that everybody knows what it is. But basically, uh, LP stands for luff perpendicular. So if you go from the clue and you draw a line into the head stay, where that line creates a 90 degree intersection with the head stay, there's a dimension, and that's what we call LP. That's the left perpendicular of the sail. And it's always expressed in a percent, 120, 130, 150, 110. And so if you think about, in simple terms, from your head stay to the front of your mast, let's say it was 10 feet. If you had 100% jib, the LP of that jib would be 10 feet. If you had 150% jib, the LP of that jib would be 15 feet. And that's all that LP stands for. Um, when we think about overlap or LP or sizing, it's important to consider, is our boat a head sail driven boat? Is it a mainsail driven boat? For instance, I've got a lot of clients that have older Bristol's or Little Harbors, very head sail driven, smaller mains. Annie's boat has, is a pretty head sail driven boat, needs a nice head sail. The mainsail does a nice job, but it's, but it's not like a, a J46 that has a big mainsail and you know not as much head sails required or some of the newer boats like the Hansi's where you have just a non-overlapping jib and a big main so that's one of the considerations when we think about sizing the other thing we think about is everyone has a different tolerance towards heel so we have to think about okay um, if I have a 130 or 140 and I use that as my primary sail I'm going to have to reef it a lot if I have people on board don't heel or I sail a lot in conditions where I always have heavy weather if you're in the Caribbean you're always sailing in Christmas winds, that 140 might be reefed all the time. So if you're sailing with your sail reef more than 25% of the time, your head sail's probably too big. You need to think about a smaller sail, uh, whether you reef, go with a smaller sail next time buy one, or whether you have two sails. One you use up here on the East Coast in the summers, another one you're using down the islands in, in the winters. Um, performance oriented, if you're really performance oriented, you might find that you have a need for a bigger head sail and a smaller head sail. Uh, and that comes back to the numbers of head sails in the inventory. You know, some of my clients, especially extended cruisers, a lot of them will have something that I call a Yankee, smaller overlap, higher clue, and they use that for passage making. And then they have something they use when they're back home for cruising in uh, general, where they know they're going to have to tack more, they want to point more, they're going to be lighter winds. So that, that's how you, what starts that process about thinking about what size head sail to go with. So shaping and clue height. Um, shape most often is determined by the boat characteristics. Every boat sails differently. Um, a high list 54 versus um, an island packet 45. Very different performance characteristics of the boat and my shape considerations on how I design and build a sail. The building of the sail will be the same, but the shape and the design process will be very different between those two boats. Um, it's also driven by the head sail options. If I know I'm building you a 130 and you have a smaller heavy weather jib, or in Andy's case, for instance, we're looking at building a 140 and he's thinking about doing a 100. So I might build that 140 as more of an all-purpose shape and give him a little bit more power for uh, performance in light, medium, medium, heavy, but I don't have to make that sail take him from zero to 30 He's got something that at 20 knots, he can shift and go 20 or 30 with a smaller head sail. So that lets me change my shaping characteristics of when I design the sail. Um, shape's also driven by venues. If you know you're just sailing on the Chesapeake or just sailing up on the East Coast, we generally have lighter winds. But if you know you're gonna be doing around the World Rally or you're gonna be doing something in the Caribbean where there's gonna be higher winds, you might think about um, changing the shape of a sail or change the design characteristics of a sail. Especially a lot of boats 
only go with one head sail. So we, we're asking one sail to do a lot. So we have to think about the best cloth, the uh, best design characteristics, and make sure all of our reefing options for that head sail are really working well. Um, hand in hand with that shaping and, and sizing is clue height. Now we have to think about visibility. Is that a higher priority than performance? Uh, clue height can help reduce chafing. The higher we go, John, we can start clearing the lifelines, clearing things on the deck, cabin house, uh, chicken bars, all that kind of stuff. Um, but it also affects the way the sail trims. Generally, the higher your clue is, the better the sail is going to be reaching and running. The lower your clue is, the better it's going to be upwind. Uh, because if you think about the dynamics, the geometry, the lower your clue is, as you start to ease the, the sheet of the sail, you're taking proportionally less load off the leech. So you're starting to let the leech twist off, or less load off the foot, more off the leech. So as soon as you ease with a lower clue, the leech is going to twist off more, and the foot's not going to ease as much. Where if you have a higher clue, you're, the sail's more balanced. So as you ease the sheet, you're easing more evenly off the leech and the foot. The sail's better for reaching because of that. And what I find is a lot of cruisers don't change their leads fore and aft or inboard and outboard. And so by going a little bit higher in the clue, you've created a better all-purpose sail that's going to be trimmed you know, 95% of the time the right way as opposed to 80% right and 20% you know, wrong when, it, when you start to change your point of sail. So clue height becomes an important consideration in that regard. Just like the mainsail, we want to think about what details are really important for us when we construct. Reefing reinforcements, um, it's hard to see from this picture, but when you have your tack patch, and it goes here, there'll be a second patch that comes down horizontally and extends into this area. So as you reef the sail, you've got reef patching on that head stay. It, because if you just started reefing the sail without that, as you get back into here, there's no reinforcement on the sail you know, where it wraps around. So you'd have one layer of cloth bearing all the load. So you want to have some reef reinforcements built into the sail. I like reefing indicators. I don't show them here. But I usually do a little red stripe or dots even at 10% and 20%. It gives you that visual from the cockpit when you've reefed your sail in. Uh, makes it really nice. UV covers. Um, UV covers, if you go a higher tech material, you might go with the UV Dacron, and they make the UV Dacron where it's treated one side or it's treated both sides. If it's treated both sides, it gets a little bit heavier. Say, instead of being four and a quarter ounce, it's five and a half ounces, but it lasts twice as long. Um, and that's good for performance rate sales, and it's going to get you about six to seven years of life. If you go Sombrella, the Sombrella materials that we see out there are about nine and a half to ten ounces. That's probably going to be a seven to ten year life on the cover. So again, it comes back to um, what your drivers are, affordability and performance issues versus longevity issues. But UV covers are, are critical on all these sails. Uh, and we like to have the UV cover wrap around the back of the sail. A lot of UV covers we'll see are on one side of the sail. Um, machine sewn, hand sewn, same as the main sails. Head and tack webs here, and I do them out of strong spectra so they have good flex qualities and they, they wear well. Wide seam allowances, multi-step stitch, and strong clue rings. And this will just show you some pictures. I wrap all my webs at the head and the tack in the umbrella or in the Dacron so they're UV covered. All my UV covers we do with a straight zigzag instead of the multi-step because that's sacrificial. We have to be able to remove that cover at some point in the future, replace it. I want to make sure I can get it off without damaging the sail. This shows you those reef hash marks. Um, this shows you machine stitch webs that are all underneath the UV and then the hand stitching. And same thing with the clue rings. All the webs are underneath the UV. I try and, as we talked about in the very beginning, UV is a huge factor for all these offshore sails. The sails are out in the sun a lot. We want to try and protect as much as possible all of the different, uh, whether it's stitching, whether it's the material. Certain materials hold up well to UV, other materials don't. But the, the more we can cover from the sun, the longer the sail is going to last. So we'll go quickly. Stay sails and solen jibs. Um, we're seeing a trend. It used to be a lot of cutter rigs where you had a stay sail. And that's a great sail plan for offshore sailing. It really offers you a lot of options. We've seen a trend in the last 10 years towards um, solen jibs, as I refer to them, with more of a reacher out in front. So you, you see the sagas have that layout. Some of the southerlies uh, have that layout. 
This is a really nice option. The boat can sail well under this self-tacking jib or a small jib, non-overlapper. And then this is more of a big, lighter air, reaching-oriented sail. Um, the, the big key here is if you have options to reduce sail area without having to re replace a sail uh, or without having to change a sail on your furler, you're going to be in much better shape. So we've even, I think your dad's boat was one of the first ones we did it on, and then Andy's boat I think you did it on your 48. But if it wasn't set up for a stay sail, now you can do these um, removable inner four stays that are made out of a Dynex ducts or something like that, so you don't, have to have a, you don't have to have a wire anymore. So there are a lot of options to deploy a stay sail. Um, we've also done some of these where they're actually on a, a torsion line that kind of rolls up with a little furling drum, so you can actually have a deployable stay sail that's separate and it's not always there. So there are lots of options for setting up a secondary head sail for heavy weather conditions. Downwind sails, this kind of gets to the fun part. It's kind of like the dessert for your sail inventory. Uh, adds a lot of speed. Downwind, it can really help. Asymmetrical spinnakers have, have, uh, have become very user friendly now. I've got clients with 45 and 50 footers that sail these with just two people. Um, lots of different cloth weights depending upon the boat size. Um, you can go everything from, you know, cruisers I recommend a three quarter ounce up to an ounce and a half. Bigger boats maybe even an ounce and a half to 2.2 ounce. Because they're tri-radial we can change weights of cloth so we can offer a lot of engineered approaches to making the sail stronger. This shows just a traditional dousing sleeve, which in many cases is the right way to go. And this shows a top-down furler, which has been kind of the buzz in the industry the last couple of years. They work really well. They're pretty expensive. And they're not always as easy as the, the top, uh, as the sleeve. So it's, it's technology. What I find is when, once you get over 50 feet, these top-down furlers start to really come into their own. When you're in like a 40 or 45 footer, the sleeve might be just more practical and might be easier to use actually. Um, we've been doing more specialty sales for downwind. As, as new designs like the Hanses, which only have non-overlapping jibs, when you start to reach with the boat with a small jib up front, you're going to lose a lot of horsepower. So we've been doing a lot more of these reaching genikers. Um, they're usually set up on a furler, so they're very easy to operate. Um, I've even got a number of clients that they've made a conscious decision to go with a smaller Genoa, so maybe something like 115% LP, and some kind of a reaching sail like this, because it's good reaching, it's also good downwind, and it's on a furler, so they've chosen that route instead of a spinnaker and instead of a big Genoa. They've deliberately gone to, we've got a client with a Harbor Rescue 43, they went to 115% jib is their biggest head sail with a, a reaching type of sail like this on a furler. The, the traditional spinnaker we all think about of uh, symmetrical with the pole, they're great if you're making a long downwind passage, but as cruisers, the pole, the extra sheets and guys, it's more complex and you need more people to operate them. With a cruising spinnaker, an asymmetrical spinnaker, it's much easier for someone to single-handed or two people to sail with that sail. This takes a few more than two people or takes two really experienced people to make that work. Quite often, it's going to be one of those decisions of is the passage long enough or is it going to be up long enough to justify the effort to put it up. Um, and then the last option downwind is just wing and wing, which is quite often a very good option for us. If we're someplace in the 150, 180 range, you can wing and wing, put out a whisker pole. I show it without the, the main being up, but you can also do it with the main being up and have a preventer out in the main. A lot of times you can not do two head sail, but just do wing out your general with a whisker pole, take your main out the other way with the preventer, and you know, create the barn door effect. It's a very effective method of sailing downwind. It's very controllable. So it's, it's something to think about. If you don't have a whisker pole, you don't have a preventer, but you're going to make a passage, they might be two very valuable things to put on your boat. Now you've improved your downwind performance without really adding a lot to your budget. So the last thing we'll move to is storm sails. Um, you know, in, in a perfect world, we should all have a way of deploying a storm jib or some type of storm sail forward, and that's where that inner force day comes in. So whether you're a cutter and you have a stay sail up there now, or whether you figure out a way of deploying a stay sail. But I always recommend if you have storm sails, deploy them either at dock or when it's calm, but use them before you need them. So go out and, and make sure, you know, get on a soapbox. 79, the fastnet race, 
uh, we had a first major, major tragedy in the racing industry. And all the boats had storm sails, but they never deployed them. So they go out, they get caught in this huge storm, they have to deploy their sails, and what they find out is they didn't know where they trimmed. Half of them, the slides didn't fit in the mast because they never tried them. You know, it was just, they met the rule by having it, but they never tested it. So a lot of the carnage that happened in that race came because the boats had storm sails, but they were never tried. So we want to try them. Fast forward to 1998 with the Sydney Hobart race. So the Sydney Hobart race proved another thing. All those boats had storm sails. They all have sailed with them. They deployed them. You know, it's a racing where you have, to, you have to put it up before you do the race. The problem there was the storm sail standards hadn't been updated since the 1950s. So now you have these modern day race boats with sizing recommendations for boats that were built in 1950. So they were a lot bigger than what they should have been. You know, you have much more easily driven hulls. So storm sails are something that we shouldn't just say, okay, here's a recommended sizing and we just default to that. We should stop and think about what kind of boat do I have? How do I sail? Is it just a husband and wife? Am I going to actively use them? And if so, you want to think about how you design them, how you build them, and how they're going to do, be deployed. Uh, this shows a lot of these single-handed uh, boats now, they're doing these races, they'll have these multiple furlers with multiple smaller and smaller sizes. This is a great idea for deploying a storm sail, having a little furler with a storm sail on it. And now, the way they're building these furlers, you could have a top-down furler for a spinnaker, and that can serve double purpose and be used for a storm jib. Uh, so now you've got one piece of equipment you bought that's being used in two different ways. Um, this just shows storm tri sail in a ready bag. So you can have the track coming down, the sail's already set up, so you're going offshore, it's ready to be deployed. So if you need it, you're not trying to dig it out of a bilge, hank it on, it's already hanked on the track and ready. This shows a little pet peeve of mine, but this is a racing boat. He's got a storm sails up, and he's got a storm tri sail connected to his boom. My feeling is always if you have to put up a storm tri sail, eliminate the boom. Anytime you get to a third reef, or storm tri sail conditions, the boom's a weapon, it's not a tool. So immobilize the boom so it can't be swinging around and let this sail more like this. And, and this is another bad picture, but this shouldn't be trimmed to the boom, it should just be trimmed to the aft, almost like a Genoa. This shows you a really poorly executed storm tri sail. Your storm tri sail should always be high enough that it's not gonna hit someone in the head. Here, you know, if they tack or if they jive, this sail's gonna you know, sweep people off the boat. And it can be done just by changing where your hoist is by having a pennant on the sail. But storm tri sails are something that we shouldn't go offshore and not give consideration to them. We need to have a plan and we need to play with them before we get out there. And, you know, f just final thought for you to take away. Um, you're not in this alone. There are lots of sail makers that have a lot of experience designing sails, lots of fabric choices, lots of equipment choices. It's uh, some of the things, simple things, have really made life easier for us. You've got a lot of people who've done this ahead of you, so talk to your friends, um, dock mates who have done some cruising, but they're just uh, lots, of, lots of options, lots of experience for you guys to kind of gain and share by talking to people. A um, couple questions, or I'll hang out in the break and ask questions. Yeah, we'll, we'll go straight into the break if you have questions for Chuck. Uh, thank you very much, Chuck, that was excellent. Thank you. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. Email your comments and suggestions to david at oceansailingpodcast.com.au. See you next week. People walk into me and say I'm sorry. I want to look back, I want to talk to them Sometimes I wonder how they've lived a life like this before Some are just so damn young So turn around and hear them speak So turn around and help them out Turn around you're watching them cry And watching some getting ready to die 
Then knocked down to the ground and can't get back up. Feelings are sad. I want to be mad. Days here are like precious gold. If you live another one, you have faith to carry on. So turn around and hear them speak. So turn around. Turn around, cause you're watching them cry And watching some getting ready to die The memory of their courage is taped in my head It plays a soft one too I painted a picture I picture cold, dark sand and skies I painted the future how it's supposed to be With warm sun and a bright town So turn around and hear them speak So turn around and help them out Turn around them cry and watching some getting ready to die